Shabbat Shalom, everybody. This is Teddy Wilson here at Seekers of Yahweh. And we're in Craigmont, Idaho, where it was nice and warm today. We had a good time together in the park during Yahweh's Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot. And this evening, we want to invite everybody out there that is watching this, or we'll watch it later in the recorded version. We want to invite you to come in and praise and worship with us and share what we have to give our King. And all that is, is our time, our hearts, our voices, but most importantly, to understand who and what we are in the body of Messiah, because this is his time. It's not our time. It's his time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what we're going to be doing this evening is a little bit different than you're used to seeing on Restoring the Hebrew Mind. We will be... Uh, having a uh, study here at the end, but first we're going to be uh, having some testimonies as well as some music Brother Mitch is going to be bringing. So we're going to start this evening off by sounding the shofar and praying in, and then we're going to have some testimonies from the brethren here to exalt our King during this time. And we've had such a great day, have we not? Hallelujah. I want to thank everybody for being here, and I want to thank everybody for joining us online. And we're going to begin this evening by letting Brother Mitch bring a little bit of testimony. Then we're going to have a couple more testimonies. I'm going to give a testimony. Uh, one of the sisters is going to come up and give a testimony. And then we're going to pass around the mic to anybody else who might want to say something on behalf of Yahweh and what he's done for you. Hallelujah. Brother Mitch. Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat, Shabbat shalom, everybody. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, my, my testimony tonight is a little bit different, but a lot of you that know me know my testimony. And uh, But my testimony is basically that up to a year ago, up to a year ago, uh, oh, maybe not even a year, but Sylvia and I, we uh, were going through some some troublesome, troublesome times in our life, but uh, yeah, I wasn't even playing music anymore. I didn't, I didn't want to play guitar. I didn't want to sing anymore. And I was just uh, not where I wanted to be, I guess, in my life. But uh, Sister Diane's making me nervous right now because she keeps on telling me to speak louder, and, and I and I can't speak louder. <laughs> They'll still be over there. Hallelujah. Uh, but uh, we came up for the feast of Passover, and uh, things started to change. And they started to change in a big time and in a beautiful way. Hallelujah. I picked up a guitar, and we brought it up here with us and started playing music again. And... and now we sing and play everywhere we go, wherever we're invited or whoever will have us. And we just love praising and, and serving Yahweh. And, I, you know, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful life. It's better than being out there in the world because the world has nothing to offer at all. We've tried it. I've tried it. And it has nothing. I always joke around. I always say I was busted, disgusted, and couldn't be trusted, you know. But, but uh, you know. The world has nothing to offer. I don't want the world anymore. And I and I, I just want to follow my Father, which is in heaven, and his name is Yahweh. Hallelujah. I want to share this song before I go. Is that somebody else? The Spirit of Yahweh Oh, feel my life My whole being, Spirit of Yahweh, oh, feel my life, oh, feel my soul, and my whole being, oh. Fill me with, with all your presence, with all your power, 
And with your love, fill me with, with all your presence, with all your power, and with your love, Spirit of Yahweh. my life, oh, feel my soul, and my full being, Spirit of Yahweh, oh, feel my life. my soul and my full being oh fill me with with all your presence with all your power And with your love, oh, fill me with, with all your presence, with all your power, and with your Now that's a testimony. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother Mitch. You've been a total blessing to everyone here. And on behalf, I'm sure, of everyone, we want to thank you for letting Yahweh work in your life. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> so, more than likely, if not, If this sister isn't watching right now, she'll be watching later. But what I have here is something that one of the sisters wrote on her Facebook page, and I'm going to be sharing that. And what she wrote was a very, it was, actually she was writing this to someone else that's her friend on Facebook. And you don't run into too many good things on Facebook very often. But this was a tearjerker. It's something that has caused me to really step back and do a moral inventory of not only myself, but those around me. Because if you show me who you're hanging around with, and I'm going to show you what is going to influence you and who you're going to be? Who you surround yourself with every day is definitely going to influence, influence who you are and what you're going to be. Do not be unequally yoked. That doesn't just mean married. Uh -uh. So, <clears throat> before we get to it, as the story goes, I got here almost you know, six, seven years ago. I stepped off the bus in this metropolis of a town of 500 people. 500, well, depending on what side of town you come in on, 501 at one end and 510 on the other. I don't know why it takes so long to do a census of around approximately 500 people and why they can't get it right on one end or the other because it's only three blocks long. Maybe some of the locals are the ones doing the census. 
Hallelujah. All right. So when I got here, I had $300 to my name. I had basically left behind everything I knew. And I sent three boxes ahead of myself and I got off and I had another box or two. And in the boxes I sent ahead of myself was some books. And it was a, uh, like, were you, like a journal. I can't remember who gave it to me. But I just put them in the corner of my desk. And of course, over the years, my desk has grown into two desks. And pretty soon you begin to pile stuff, needing tidying up like I do. <laughs> and you bury stuff that really has no meaning at the very bottom of that stack. And every now and then it's time to really clean up and make room for new stuff. So I was gonna throw away these two books that look like journals. I actually threw them in the trash can and something just told me, Grab, grab those books out of there and look and see what's in them. And when I grabbed the first book, I started to flip through the pages, and I had written in that book. And it inspired me. Because I don't remember writing this. But in the front of my scriptures... I had taped a little sticky note in there, and it says 25 years from 1-7-2011 plus 25 years is 20-36. Now, I, I, I mean, this thing's been in there for I don't know how long, and I couldn't remember what it was until I picked that book up out of the garbage. So I want to share with you what Yahweh can do in your life. And I want to share what he's done in my life since 2011. At the top of the first page, it says, I entered eldership into the Messianic faith. This is Now, you know I don't use that term very often. So this has been a while back. Entered into eldership in the Messianic faith 12 19 20, 2011 after following the teachings since 2004. So this is when I was brought into the prison ministry by Seekers of Yah Prison Ministries in California. <clears throat> and I begin to put entries in here. 1 7 2012, the number 25 came to me while watching Brad Scott teach. 1 7, 2011 plus 25 would come to the year 2036. And I prayed about it and I asked myself, will this be the time of my activity in the body of Messiah? 1 8, 2012. Now watch how quick Yahweh begins to work here. 1 8, 2012. I was speaking to Elder Frank Brown. <laughs> he was such a good. <laughs> he was such a devout man of Yah. And I learned so much from him. And when he died, I was just crushed. So this was before that, and I said, and I, I put in here, was speaking to Elder Brown in Arkansas about the prison ministry, and he revealed to me that he was planning to retire in six months, and he asked me to take over his rather large prison ministry. And we prayed together and asked for Yali's direction in that matter. And after that, I feel led to accept. One nine. 2012, after speaking to both Brad Scott and John Schaefer, they seem to be very supportive in the idea of the taking over of the newsletter job. 
And I feel after praying about it and seeking counsel of other wise believers that Yahweh may be opening this huge door. What a blessing life truly is in Yahshua Messiah. 111, 2012. <clears throat> Things continue to move forward very well. Made definite heaven sent connection over the past few days with people distributing uh, the Hallelujah scriptures. And Yahweh is so good to his people. 118, 2012, still pressing forward. I've encountered a small setback. There was a problem with the funding with a copy machine. It takes a lot of ink and copy paper to do prison ministry. <laughs> and so there was a minor setback, as in I couldn't afford to do it. But yet this huge job had been uh, laid in my lap. <clears throat> kind of a misunderstanding between myself and Elder Brown, perhaps, but Yahweh will provide. 121, 2012. Made some contacts today with other Messianic worshipers. Uh, we'll be fellowshipping with them often with no confirmation on a copier. Still no confirmation on a copier. We'll continue to pray and seek Yahweh, Yahweh's will concerning the matter. 123, 2012. Had to relocate myself and the ministry to my brother's house. Spoke with Brad Scott. He made plans to get the computer needed for the prison ministry. Now, this is where it began to take off. <clears throat> I'd never met Brad Scott at that point. But John Schaefer, the elder that ordained me first, knows him very well. And so uh, I didn't know any of this was happening. But they were trying to set things up, and he was speaking up for me. And... I talked to Brad on the phone, and he said, Teddy, how can I help you get started? And I said, well, how about sending me 10 copies of everything you got, and I'll start there. And he said, I don't think you understand. Is there a Best Buy or a Walmart or something near you where you can go down there, get a computer, a printer? I want you to get a case to carry your computer in, yada, yada, yada. And Brad Scott bought this ministry, computers, printers, and everything else to get started, and a copy machine, right? The adversary sure doesn't want to stop pestering me in my work for the Messiah. Still, I will press forward toward the goal. If we just submit to him, he will work a work in us. And if he said it, I'll trust you with a little. And if you take care of that, I'll trust you with something very, very important. That's the way he operates. Now I have one of the biggest blessings I've ever had in my life because I refuse to bend and I will be knocked down. Or I might get knocked down, but I'm going to get up. Press forward. 129, 2012, I got the check from Brad Scott for computer yesterday. Praise Yah. Fellowship with brothers and sisters during Sabbath. Had a great time. Things are looking great. Bad part about it was I went and got the computer. I went and got the printer. I got back. Didn't even know how to turn either one of them on. So I had to go back to Best Buy. I told the Geek Squad, listen, either you guys show me how to type a letter and print it out, or you can just take this stuff back. Because <laughs> it's not going to do me any good. So they sat down and they fixed everything for me, and they said, here's how you do this, and print it on out. And that's how we started. Hallelujah. 2-3-2012, computer is up and running. Seekers of Yah, Bakersfield Branch is on its feet, all to the praise of Yahweh and His Son, Yahshua. May Yahweh bless the efforts of this ministry, and may he keep my heart steadfast on his laws and its precepts. 2 7 2012, I printed the first copies of one of my studies today, sending it out to a few of the elders. We'll wait for their response. I thank and praise Yahweh and his son, Yahshua. What a change he has made in my heart and my life. 2 11 2012, 
all is well, making new connections almost every day, have sent study that I wrote to three key leaders in the Messianic movement, and we'll seek what become and we will see what becomes of it. No matter what, I feel so blessed to be in fellowship with all of these men. Praise Yahweh. 219, 2012. Things are coming along as a bit slow. But nevertheless, good things continue to happen. Was asked yesterday on Sabbath by a local pastor to do something on a radio broadcast. This would be a huge step forward in this small ministry and for the furtherance of Yah's message. 3 1 2012. One more huge step forward in the prison ministry got the okay to send first set of DV CDs and DVDs in to the brothers in California Correctional Institution in Tehachapi. 3 6 2012. Went to the post office today and sent off first set of CDs and DVDs to the Messianic group and CCI. Now, these weren't mine. These were somebody else's. Also got my ordination, ordination certificate signed by John Schaefer through the Torrey Institute yesterday. How unsearchable are the mercies of Father Yahweh and Messiah Yahshua, his son, 4-1-2012 was invited to stay with Jan and Mike D. Tommaso. When things are moving forward, Yahweh has shown me that he is much smarter than me, and he is faithful. <laughs> that was at that point where you get kind of comfortable in what you believe. Well, I've got the Torah. I've got the Sabbath. I've got the names. I've got this. And then the next day you wake up and he says, no, you don't. <laughs> right? So I don't say that anymore. I ask, do we got this? 410, 2012, have thoroughly searched out the teachings of the two Yahweh theory. This is where I gained, started to gain momentum. Uh, there may be much more to learn, but at this point, all evidence shows that the roots of that is of a pagan origin. 5, 3, 2012, received two donations as of late, first from uh, a sister and the second from the pastor that invited me to go to the uh, radio broadcast and his wife. Also, was one was for the ministry and the other was to help me with the funds to move to my mom's in Idaho. I was blessed to bring the word of Yahweh last night at above said assembly and Yah was exalted. And for this is my purpose in life. 10 3 2012 opened a bank account for the ministry today. Hallelujah. 10 6 2012. On 10 3 2012, account was open for Seekers of Yah Ministries. I put $25 in the checking and $25 in savings. Praise Yahweh. I had forgotten all about this. And shame on me. Because I should still be writing in that book. And every one of us should be keeping account of what Yahweh is doing in our life. Every day. So that we can get up and testify. Or sit down and testify. That he works at his speed for his purpose and not our own. And on the day I found that, it wasn't long after that that I seen this, written by Sister Amanda Wilson in Texas. And it was to one of her friends. And she said, who cares? Listen to this. This is from a sister. Who cares what other people think or say? Don't listen to small-minded people. Surround yourself with believers, truth speakers, truth seekers, strong-willed, dreamers, achievers, and encouragers, inspirers, and hope givers. We don't have time for dogmatic, backbiting, slandering. We don't have time for it. This sister knows that. You wonder how some people get to where they are? 
They keep our Heavenly Father number one in everything. They know they can do anything through our King, no matter what anyone says. They cry, they sweat, they stay up countless nights, they work when they don't want to, they push harder when they feel they can't, they get back up when they fall down, they keep going even when they can't see the other side. And then one day, they say to themselves, wow, I did it. With the help of my Heavenly Father, and it was all worth it. It was because they never gave up and they never stopped believing. This is an inspiration to me. And it should be an inspiration to everyone in this room. You might feel so minute where you are right now. But you better bet you're sitting exactly where Yahweh wants you. Hallelujah. You're sitting exactly where you should be because we are going to inspire, encourage, press forward, cover. We're going to grow. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to say that's unclean. We're going to do that. We are going to stay underneath the covering of Yah here. The way we eat, the way we drink, the way we dress, what we speak. Exalt our King and one another in the body of Messiah. And understand that he is our Melchizedek. When I look at those things that I was keeping a record of, sometimes I think to myself, we forget about the simplicity in, in our walk with him. It can be something so simple. And I want to inspire everybody in the room because I didn't get here. This place, this stuff that we have here, it didn't come for me. It wasn't provided by me. I only oversee this stuff. It's not mine. It's his. It's what he's provided for us. But if he can trust me with a little, maybe we can do this together in the millennial reign. Right? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So that's my testimony this evening is to encourage you and, sit and let everybody know that Yahweh wants to work in your life. He wants to use you. It's more than just bringing you in and setting you down. He wants to bring you in and exalt you into a position that you can represent him to the world. Hallelujah. Sister Linda, do you have something to say about Yahweh this evening? Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom, brothers and sisters. I am so blessed to be. Start over? Okay. Shabbat shalom, brothers and sisters. I am so blessed to be here. You will never know. I prayed to come here for so long. I started studying with Teddy probably a year and a half ago. And I knew I didn't have what I needed. And I knew I needed Hebrew, but I tried to look at Hebrew and tried to study it, but it wasn't right because it didn't use the name. So I kept studying with Teddy, and then I kept praying, like, how are you, you going to get me to Idaho? I'm just this little old lady in southeast Colorado. And Yahweh answered my prayer and provided for me to come here. And when I... Of my journey of getting here, one of, one of my kids was supposed to take me to the airport, and that didn't work out. And so I'm really, you know, shaking in my boots and wondering why. And then I think of another sister, and I think, well, she could probably take me into Colorado Springs. But then she talks to me, and she says, Linda, I'll just take you right into the airport. All you got to do is put gas in my car. And I'm going, wow, this is too good to be true. And so I get to the airport, and for some reason, I'm on the wrong gate. I'm, I'm two concourses from where I'm supposed to be. And when I realize that I'm at the wrong gate, I go to another airline's gate, and I say, get me a wheelchair and get me there really fast. I'm going to miss this airplane. And it's 20 
till 11 when my flight leaves and the lady says, there is no way you can get there. But I still stand there and I wait for somebody to get me. And nobody's coming in. And she said, we got seven wheelchairs ordered for right here and it's not happening. And so I think, okay, y'all, I'm going to run for it. I've got to go down two levels, two escalators, to a train and, and go two spots, a really long ways on this train. And when I get to that airplane, the, the ticket guy looks at me and he says, Linda Cox, right? And I said, yes. And he says, run for it. They're holding it for you. Praise Yahweh, I'm here. So we have a cordless mic for anyone who would like to say something on behalf of what Yahweh is doing in your life. Sister Don, could somebody hand the cordless mic to her? Hallelujah. I don't even know if I can get through this. <sighs> Yahweh has been so good to me. I was raised in an independent fundamental Baptist home. So I had the truth. And then I walked away from it for a while. Came back. Walked away. Came back. And then about 20 years ago, I got into cocaine and got pregnant. Starting having, having pains about uh, two and a half months into the pregnancy. And I went to the doctor and they did an ultrasound for almost half an hour. They couldn't find a heartbeat. And they figured my son was bad. So I went home that week and I did more cocaine than I'd ever done because I wanted to die because I killed the one thing that Yahweh had given me. Went back the next year or the next week and I prayed all the way. Just save my baby and I'll quit the cocaine. When they did the ultrasound, my son waved his hand at me and just say, Mama, it's okay. I'm alive. So I quit the cocaine and I determined that I was going to get back into church and start doing right based on what I knew. <laughs> and I did. And then I got disillusioned by the church and things that I saw and all the questions that I had that their answers didn't make sense to. And then my dad died. Dad was my rock. My dad was the one that loved the word more than anything. He always told me, he said, Vaughn, you be a Berean. Don't believe what I tell you. You search it out for yourself. You study it for yourself. Last year of his life, I was living in the same house with my parents and my sister. And when I get up at night because I couldn't sleep or I had to go to the bathroom or something, my dad's life was always on. He was always at his desk in the Word. He couldn't sleep, so he sat at his desk and he stayed in the Word. Because my rock. And when he died, my mom told me that I had been a disappointment to him my entire life. And I fell apart. I had a friend at that time, sweet Christian lady, and Abba took her away too. 
And I walked out of the church. I said, you know what, Christianity doesn't work. It just doesn't work. I don't want anything else to do with it. I know he's real. But I don't want anything else to do with the church. Christianity doesn't work for me. I can't do it. And I've been this goodness left me in that position for two years. And then he started letting me see some of the things that were going on. Like, I've read the Bible too many times. I can see the signs. I know what time it is. And so I started praying. I know you're real. That, I don't have to question. I want truth. I want truth. But you're going to have to do it. <laughs> because I know Christianity doesn't have to. Saba first led me to Dr. Michael Link, who had a Sabbath on the series, or a series on the Sabbath. And that opened my eyes. Didn't understand everything, but I said, okay, keep, I'm going to start keeping Sabbath as best I know how. Then he let me find Jim Staley's identity crisis. Blew the blinders off. I said, okay, I'm, I know I'm headed in the right direction. I can feel it, but I need some depth. I need to be able to search things out and know the, what I'm being taught. Is truly true. And that maybe it is. For the first time in my life, I'm getting fed. I'm being convicted. I love it when you step on my toes because it means I need to grow more. I took Teddy's class. You gave me the ability to search the truth for myself. <laughs> and thanks to Yeshua and my salvation, it's the greatest gift. Praise God. Yahshua did that. My name is Laura Wilson. I'm not related to Teddy. <laughs> I'm from Sweet Home, Alabama. This is my sixth Feast of Tabernacles, and I have to tell you, this is my first real one. This is what I always expected Feast to be like. And um, it was right before Passover, I got laid off from my job where I had been working for nearly 12 years. And um, needless to say, it would not be financially possible for me to attend this feast if it was not for Yahweh's blessing on me. And so... All this time I've been unemployed, I had one job interview and got the job. And bag it, I got to go back to work when I get home. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Anybody else? And now a word from one of our
sponsors. Uh, hallelujah. I, you know, I was telling some of the ladies, I know it like this, definitely telling the ladies when I got here, you know, everybody says, everybody says this is a practice, this is a practice, this is a practice. Okay. I've heard Teddy say it. And Laura just said it herself. You know what? It's real this year. I've been to several other tabernacles, and there is a love, and there is an affection in this room where there's not a discord, and there's not a disunity, and there's not this big bunch of dysfunction going on, and there's not people over here doing this and people over here doing that. It truly is when you see brothers and sisters, brothers and friends that live in unity together, wanting to grasp on to the knowledge of Yahweh and the depths of his language. There, the beauty of seeing Mitchell so excited today over what he found in the scriptures. You know, I can't even explain the joy that is, was to sit one-on-one -on -one with someone and watch them just desire it from the depths of their heart. And I'll honestly say that it's not anywhere else. It's not anywhere else. I don't see anyone else. And Teddy said it, and I'll say it. No one else is teaching the Malchisedic. No one else is teaching the language with the Torah intact, where you're going to have any kind of chance to get into the first resurrection. And what about everybody else? We have this beautiful unity here today. And we need to take that out to wherever we go, and we need to shine through our words and through our actions because the priesthood brings forth the praises of Yahweh Elohim, and those praises are your shining forth in your words and your actions. I'm, I'm very, very, very blessed to be here, and, and um, I feel the same way Dawn does. Um, I wouldn't have had a chance without without Teddy Wilson, Seekers of Yahweh in this language, had Yahweh not put me in a place to see that. And I am forever grateful. Sometimes I don't act like it, but I am forever, but I am, I am forever grateful. And to see that joy in everybody else, you know, I just, some of you I don't even know, but I love you. I love you and I want you to have it so much. The depths of the truth that's here, I want you to have it so much. And if you're not here this year, we, we really would like to see you at Passover. And, you know, let us help you if we can, okay? Thank you. Anybody else want to sound the shofar? Or the cow's horn. <laughs> Heavenly Father, great King, our Melech Zadik, we, your people, during your Moed, during your feast, we exalt you, your kingdom, your Malku, the Malku Yah. We exalt you and your presence, and you and you alone do we bow our knee to. We pray that you would look down upon us right now and let your face shine upon us, Father. For we have not turned from your tarot, your instructions, your precepts. And we present ourselves to you today and ask that you would have mercy upon all of Israel and pray that you would use us as vessels of honor to teach people how to cover themselves in your priesthood that has been since the fall in the garden. We thank you for the blood of the covenant. We thank you for the proposal that you have given to us, your bride. Hallelujah. We pray that you would strengthen us in every area of our life so that we can keep ourselves unspotted from sin. Help us to condemn sin in the flesh and to share with others that with this sin, you cannot enter the kingdom reign. Help us to shine, to put on the fine linen, to enter into your courts with praise. We thank you so much 
for your presence here in our hearts, in our minds, in our very being, and in this place that bears your name in the little town of Craigmont. Blessed be Yahweh, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commands and redeemed us by the blood of his son, Yahshua, and given us command to hear and respond to the call of the shofar. <laughs> Well, once again, we're going to be kind of shooting this from the hip. <clears throat> and I might have to move away from that. Is it still making noise? Okay. All right. Everybody grab your scriptures. Get your pens and pencils out. We're going to answer a few questions, and we're going to recap this mother and brother thing that we did last year, and we didn't record it. If anybody wants to call in for prayer, comments, or anything like that, go ahead and do so right now at 208-553-8393. That's the number to call. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to uh, call in or text and let me know if you need prayer. For those of you that are here and watching, we're going to be beginning in Matthew chapter 12. And again, if you want to call in to make a comment or ask for prayer, um, 208-553-8393 is the number to call. The two Hebrew words we're going to be studying all the way back to the ancient Hebrew on the board behind me. Sister Stephanie from Michigan. Hello. How are you doing? Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Hi. Um, so I would like prayer for my husband, Michael. He um, has an opportunity perhaps to, um, uh, well, he's graduating um, in December with his degree. And there is a professor that's interested in hiring him as what they call a pair pro which is even more than a teacher assistant. It's like you do a lot of like the lab work and everything for the students, mm -hmm. and he's really good at teaching. And um, so I'm just asking yeah, to open that um, up for him so um, he can have this, um, this job. <laughs> he's been going to school for a couple of years, so um, it would be a really uh, big blessing for him to just graduate and just kind of walk right into this position. So um, I just would like prayer for that. Okay. And I also just want to say thank you for, um, you know, all the work that you do there. Um, you know, people were giving their testimonies about, um, you know, how blessed they were and you know, being part of that first class that you actually gave and taught where we learned all about using the books. So it's been a huge blessing and it's just been a huge blessing to be able to um, speak with, you know, other um, believers, other Mishpaka there and uh, get together, you know, ladies, we get together every so often too and, um, you know, just study the word and you know, it's very true about what Amanda wrote, you know, we are um, in this, studying it, studying with people who are looking into what this actually goes back to and what the Father is really conveying to us and all about the priesthood. I mean, we're, it's a priesthood manual, so mm -hmm. um, 
I just praise y'all for giving us that and for the people who um, have done such um, diligent work between the episode Bible Polyglot and all the reference materials that we use to be able to search these things back. I just praise him for giving us these resources for such a time as this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, Sister Stephanie, I have to say that, you know, every now and then I run across one of those pupils, and you were definitely one of them. Uh, it's been a great privilege to share this form of research with you, Sister Diane and others like you, because it is life-changing. We think that the, the English version of the scriptures even I mean, if that can change lives, what life are we seeking? So every time we look a little bit deeper, he's got another revelation for us. Hallelujah. And I want to thank that it's been hallelujah. A, right. Hallelujah. And I want to thank you for your diligence as well. And all others like you. And I'm going to go ahead and pray for your, for your husband, Michael. Father, we thank you so much. Um, for hearing this prayer this evening and we lift up sister stephanie's husband to you and ask that um, your will would be done in his life if this is the door that you wish for him to go we pray that it would be open we also pray that you would give them discernment not only the wisdom and knowledge but that you would give them discernment if this is the way that he should go so you be the one who opens the door and we ask and pray all of this in the precious name of yashua our king Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, it's good to hear from you, sister, and I thank you for calling in. May Yahweh bless you. May yeah, bless. Shalom. I want to pray for traveling mercies on these two old boys from Texas, too. <laughs> because they're probably going to walk in eh, maybe any time. Now, the first time I ever met Brother Jodell, he was late. <laughs> and we had this place next door, and that's all we had. And he come moseying on up the sidewalk there, taller than the window out front, and it's a bay window. <laughs> and I turned around from teaching, and there he was, peeking in the window behind me. So if this happens again, hallelujah, it was just meant to be. <laughs> uh, but they, they had... Uh, got a hold of me a few hours ago and said they were going through Boise, so they should be pretty much here, pretty close. So we pray that Yahweh would have traveling mercies on them. We also want to pray uh, protection over all of the body of Messiah during this feast. So we know that the enemy does not like it. Too bad. Because we're going to do it. Hallelujah. Okay. So if you have not dialed the number, please do not do it. If you uh, stay with us, stay tuned all the way through this, you can go ahead and, and give us a call towards the end there. Um, if I remember, I'll open the phone line. If I don't remember, go ahead and call anyway. <laughs> so, Yahshua asks, who are my mothers and my brethren? And the significance of this Lie, the answer, the simplicity of this is so genuine. Because I think we overcomplicate things many times because of the English mind and the English language. It really makes a mess of things. Modern Hebrew, and in my humble opinion, Aramaic, also make a mess of things. It's not the original language. So anything that was not the original is just a counterfeit next year in Ava I'm going to present some evidence that Aramaic language was forced on Yahweh's people when they went into Babylon it's not Yahweh breathed it does just as much damage to the body of Messiah as the English, Latin, and Greek. They were forced to stop using 
Hebrew and to use the Aramaic language, the alphabet, alphabet, excuse me, Father. So it is not a heavenly breathed language. Neither is Greek, neither is English, neither is Latin. This is what was breathed. The stuff behind me. And I want to hear the breath of Yah. I want to be so close to him that I can feel him breathing on me. Hallelujah. So his breath is all over us. It's on the wall back there. I want to thank Sister Stephanie for those beautiful letters that she has sent us. Hallelujah. So the passage we are about to study goes much deeper than some are able to see. And the complexity is actually simplicity robed in the words of our Messiah. Let me repeat that. The complexity is actually simplicity robed in the words of our Messiah. Now, did Messiah in this chapter just speak that one verse? No. As a matter of fact, he was on a tangent with the Pharisees. So if we go back and we study all of it, the complexity of what he was saying is made simple if we go back and look at the context of this chapter. Now, we've done this last year, but it wasn't recorded. And I'm kind of glad because I had to rehash some things here. And what we're going to do is we're going to search out this simplicity. The verses leading up to the mother and brethren account is filled with the treasure of future events secured for such a time as this. Foreshadows of the cleansing of the land. Now, how many of you have ever heard a teacher say that about this chapter? This chapter foreshadows a future time period about the future of the cleansing of the land of Israel. I have a question. Is that land sanctified right now? Stay out of it. We don't belong there. We, are, we have been sanctified. So are we supposed to believe that a dog can return to its own vomit? We've been warned. We have been set apart and sanctified in the nations. And he said, when I come back, I'm going to take you. We're going to cleanse that land. He told Moshe. When he came up on the mountain, he said, I'm going to go see this, this bush that burns but doesn't burn. And when he got there, what did Yahweh tell him? Take your sandals off. You're standing on holy ground. Now, if we went over there today, could Yahweh say that? Stay off of that ground. Because you have been sanctified and justified all in the name of Yahshua Messiah. And that land does not belong to him right now, everyone. Don't get caught up in the facade of justification by falsehood. What we're going to witness in the book of Matthew is a step-by-step -step account, and he gives us the key of knowledge concerning who is going to be his mishpokah in that land. You don't even have to read between the lines. If somebody lays this out for you, it's very, very simple to see. It is complexity robed in simplicity that has been presented in the word of our Mashiach. It's very simple. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12, beginning at verse 28. And we're going to be reading through the end of the chapter. Now the Pharisees are accusing him of casting out demons by the ruler of demons. And this is the answer. 
So he's at it with these guys. I know the feeling. <laughs> but if I cast out demons by the spirit of Elohim, then the reign of Elohim has come upon you. Or how is one able to enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds a strong man? And then he shall plunder his house. So what is the context here? Binding the strong man that has taken over the house. That's the context. Verse 30. He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Because of this I say to you, all sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven men. Look at verse 32. And whoever speaks a word against the son of Adam, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the set-apart Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in what? This age or the age to come? Do you see the context of the Scripture here? He's saying that these men could not be forgiven because they were blaspheming the Spirit of Yah, because He came to bind the strong man. That's the context of the Scripture. So He's saying, if you're not with Me, you're against Me, so He's saying, I came to bind you. Right? He came to take back his father's house. That's the whole context. Now, this word in, in most English versions is the word world. In this world or the one to come. And I don't even think world is used in the Greek in both places, but nevertheless, they've supplied it for us. Now, that's Greek number 165, where the age or world is spoken of here. Let's go to the Strong's and look at this definition. Hallelujah. Greek number 165. In your Strong's. It's the Greek word aeon. And it's from the same as 104, properly an age. By extension, perpetuity. The world, specifically Jewish, a messianic period, present or future. This is talking about the thousand-year millennial reign. It's a future account. And he said that if you blaspheme the works of the Holy Spirit, you're not going to enter into that age, that reign. Now, so now we know that it's talking about the kingdom reign, the reign of Elohim, that age. So this generation is not going into that generation, is what he's speaking about. Now, this is directly connected to verse 37, so let's keep reading. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree rotten and its fruit, fruit rotten, for a tree is known by its fruit. You brood of adders. This is love talking. <laughs> How are you able to speak what is good, being wicked? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. The good man brings forth what is good from the good treasures of his heart, and the wicked man brings forth what is wicked from the wicked treasure. And I say to you, that for every idle word men speak, they shall give an account of it in the day of judgment. See, here we go in that millennial reign. He's, he's speaking of this future 
time that is, is considered by most scholars to be a messianic age. In other words, the return of the Messiah and the thousand year reign. Look at verse 37. This is directly connected to priesthood. For by your words, you shall be declared, what? Zadik. By your words, you shall be declared Zadik. And by your words, you shall be declared not Zadik. In the age to come, these men that were blaspheming the words of the Ruach within the body of Messiah, he was judging them then and saying, you will not have part in the messianic age to come, which is the thousand year millennial reign. Do we understand the context now? Now we have our context to go on. Now remember I said, we're gonna see the complexity in the simplicity of our Messiah's words. Because when we first look at this, we go, well, that's kind of hard to understand. But he sums it up really easy with these words about the mother and the brethren. But these Pharisees are being removed from office by the words of the Messiah right here. When his disciples came to him and said, Look at the beauty of the temple. Look at all the rooms. Look out. And what did he say? Not one stone will be left upon another. He said, this is coming down. I came to take back my father's house. He wasn't talking about the Hekel. Because there's a new one being prepared in the Shemaim. The diagrams. The gold, the silver, the bronze, the gates. And the people in it are being prepared in the Shemaim. We're not going to the Shemaim, but the new Yerushalayim is coming down to us in the land during the Messianic age. You see what he's saying? Now watch. So... This age to come in verse 37 is directly and rightfully threaded to the priesthood here, the Zadik, those who are made righteous. Remember, I said it earlier, make no mistake, or this morning when we were praying in and, and having breakfast. He's coming back for the righteous. Make no mistake about it. He's coming back for the Zadik. And the Zadik can only be produced by the priesthood and the priesthood is the bride that's going into the thousand-year millennial reign with the Messiah. Making sense? He's saying, you guys are not my bride. You're not even on my team. They're bench warmers. Let's take a look. Keep reading here. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answering said to them, A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Now there's that word adulterous that we studied this morning. Brother Mitch, does it mean physical fornication? Apostatizing is considered spiritual adultery right so these guys were in apostasy and he's telling them and remember these were people who were teaching the torah and using modern hebrew to do it and they were apostate from the truth and the simplicity in the messiah they were not zadik because he told his disciples later on if you want to enter in there with me you better bet that your righteousness better exceed that of the Pharisees. Do we see this? 
So how can our righteousness exceed those of people who speak modern Hebrew and taught the Torah, but yet had the oral Torah? We take away the oral Torah. We study the Torah and the original language. Our Zadikness will succeed and rise above what the Pharisees were teaching in the first century. Okay? Look at verse 40. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, we just heard a, a, a young believer speaking about this this evening. The James family's uh, daughter. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the stomach of the great fish, so shall the son of Adam be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Listen to what he says here. He's speaking to the Pharisees, everyone. Look at what he says. Men of Nineveh shall stand up in the judgment. What judgment is he speaking about? The great white throne judgment at the end of the thousand year reign that most scholars are now labeling the messianic age, the messianic era. He says the men of Nineveh will stand up in judgment with this generation and what condemn it? Because they repented at the, because they, he's speaking about Nineveh, uh, repented at the preaching of Jonah and look, a greater than Jonah is here. The sovereignness of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Shalema. And look, a greater than Shalema is here. He said, they listened to my messenger and you won't even listen to the one who sent the messenger. So you will be condemned by the people who repented. How many of us in the room have repented? Hallelujah. Do you understand what he's saying here? The gift of repentance is the key. The knowledge of the priesthood shows you how to exercise the key, where you put it, what door you open. Hallelujah. Now when the unclean spirit, he gives them a parable. Listen to this. Now, when the unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then it says, I shall return to my house from which I came. He's speaking to the wicked spirit within these Pharisees. And guess what he says? We, this, this has been there all along. He's speaking to the wicked spirit within the Pharisees, and look what he says. Now we're going to take a look at what's going on in the land of Yisrael right now. He said, you people are filled with a wicked spirit, and I'm going to get rid of it, but you're going to come back. This is about the, the spirit of the Pharisees, their dogma, their teachings, and their wish to rule Yahweh's temple and the world through their religion. He says, you Pharisees are full of an unclean spirit and I'm going to get rid of you, but you're going to come back. Watch what he says. Speaking of that wicked spirit, it says in 44, then it says, I shall return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it empty, swept and decorated. Then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits, more wicked than itself, and they enter and dwell there. And the last of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. He said, I'm going to get rid of your wicked spirit. I'm going to get it out of this land. When he talks about the house, it's not talking about just the temple. It's talking about casting them out of the land, the house of Yah. See, a man's house is not just that thing that covers him and protects him from the rain and from the cold. It's his property. 
That's his house. Everything that he owns. So he's saying, I'm going to cast you, you wicked spirit, out of this land, but you're going to come back after a certain time. And you're going to come back stronger, faster, more deceptive than ever. What is in the land? Pharisees. Modern day Judaism, robed in Pharisaical teachings, pushing the same agenda of the oral Torah as a means to produce shalom in the land. And they've been trying to do it since 1948. And there's still bombs going off every day. More destruction, more politics, more liberalism. We're going to liberate. If we think that that, in that land, is the gift of Elohim through Yahshua Messiah, without that land being cleansed, we are of, our, our, of the uh, most wicked of people. No way is that the works of Yahweh in that land. He tells them right here, I'm going to cast you out of here and you're going to come back. Seven times stronger than you were. And they have. You see, Ralph? Now, picking up at verse 46. And while he was still talking to the crowd, see, his mother and brother stood outside seeking to speak with him. Do you think that Yahshua timed this just right or what? <laughs> And one said to him, see, your mother and your brothers start st are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answering said to the one who spoke to him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And having stretched out his hand towards the taught ones, he said, See, my mother and my brothers. Yahshua was this living word right here behind us. And what he said is much deeper than physical relation, as we're going to see. The top ones in this room are the glue of the family. Those who arm themselves to protect the brethren. It's the priesthood. Everywhere we look, we see these concepts. Verse 50 says, for whoever does the desire or the will of my father who is in the heavens is my brother and sister and mother. Let's look at the wisdom of our Messiah through the eyes of our Messiah. Amen. One thing I would like to point out, verses 46 through 50 there, what we learn is that Yahshua's purpose was to build a family of heavenly descent, not earthly. You see, he had his earthly family showed up, but he's showing everyone that it's not his purpose or his will or the Father's desire to build a, a fleshly family, but his will and his wishes was to build a family of heavenly descent. And this is how we do that. By doing the Father's will. Right? It's not his will that any should, but all come to the knowledge of the truth, the emet. And the emet is declared by the priesthood, everyone. That's clean. This isn't. That's blasphemous. This isn't. 
That's holy. That's not. That's permissible, and that darn sure isn't, right? Yes, ma'am. We're standing on the inside with him. Now, this is why I say priesthood. You see, the ones that are brought into the kingdom with him are the priesthood. And that's where the bride is coming from. It, the whole story from cover to cover is about a love relationship that went wrong. So he covered it. Right? He kafar. He put a lid on it. So that it could be reconvened at a later time. For he covered that marriage covenant. Tried it again at Mount Sinai. Who felt him in? We did. So he covered it again. And then we blew the covering. So then he gave us a temporary covering. And then he finally had to manifest himself in the flesh and say, okay, I'm going to have to kill all the flesh in order to get to the spiritual family that is locked inside of each and every one of us. And it takes a priesthood to do that. Not a outward sign of an inward cleansing. It takes you burying your dead body in the name of Yahshua and coming into a covering. If you are to die without this covering, you cannot be in the first resurrection. It's not even an option. It just can't happen. So he's trying to build a family of heavenly descent, not earthly, by the what? The order of the Malki. It's the order of the king. So the question that he posed is, who is my mother and brethren? And the answer he provided right there for us. Whoever does the will of the father. And then he points at who and says, these are the ones. He points at the top ones that are with him. And he said, those are my mother and my brethren. Let's look at what he's saying here. Let's look at the words he would have used in Hebrew. And they're behind me on the board. Both of them, very simple. The simplicity of the complexity of what was spoke by our Messiah's words. It's the key. Two simple characters in two huge words that notice they both start with something strong. Right? So it's the top ones, the mishpoka. Every one of us in here have a, jo a job and an obligation as a believer to fulfill that. So when we look up this mother in the polyglot, it takes us back to the Hebrew word number 517, it's the Hebrew word ame, ame. And in the Strong's, it just has it mother as bond of the family. Now remember, he's not talking about his mother that was outside. He pointed at the brethren who were all men and said, they are my mother. What? Because the disciples, the top ones that are sitting in this room, are the bond of his family. We are the mortar. We're the blood that actually creates a scab that creates a scar that totally heals in time, but you always know that the scar was there, that's our job. 
That's the job of the priesthood, to heal and wound, connect the breach. In the ancient Hebrew lexicon, it's number 1013 AN on page 56. Page 56. Ten thirteen AN at the top there. It's in the left-hand column. You'll see it up there. And there you see the letters Aleph Mem. Ame. So we have strong water, strong liquid. Strong flowing liquid. And it can also mean what? Water and blood. Right? He said, these disciples are my blood. Do you understand what he was saying? I'm going to shed blood for these people. They're going to be strong and mighty. And this blood that I'm going to shed for these, these men that are being brought into this priesthood is going to cover the whole house of Israel. Hallelujah. Now, looking at the definition, it says mother. And we're going to go back to the root as well. One whose arms hold the family together through her work. Notice it has us as a feminine, but yet he was speaking to a group of men, the disciples, Matthew, Luke. Remember the question you asked me today, sister. Here's the answer right here. Listen to this. He's speaking to a group of men that he just brought into the priesthood, right? Or he's about to when he broke bread with them at Passover, just before Passover. He's about to bring them into the priesthood. And it's all men. And what does he say? These guys are my mother. But the definition behind this word for mother is what he was actually conveying. Because it's the bride. These men in who he put all of this knowledge and wisdom and brought into the priesthood is where the bride would come from. Look at the definition. One whose arms hold the family together. The priesthood is going to hold the family together. Through her work. It's the work of the bride. The priesthood is the bride. Through her work. This stuff is everywhere. You can't make it up. It's everywhere. Through her work. And what? Love. How do we love Elohim, everybody? Following his commands. When the bride, the priesthood, begins to follow the commands and show us that we love him and we want him to return, these people are going to produce something that what holds the family together. Because the root system here declares that this word, amen, means this. Number 1013 on page 55. It's the same two letters. The action root is to bind. Wait a minute. So the priesthood, the bride, her, is supposed to hold the family together and bind them like sheaves. When we gather the wheat, does this make sense? The action root is to bind concretely. What is the word there? Glue. We are the glue that holds the family together when we enter into the priesthood of the Malchizedek.
The pictograph Aleph rep represents strength, and the mem is water or any other liquid. Combined, these pictographs mean strong liquid. Glue was made by placing the hides and other animal parts of slaughtered animals in a pot of boiling water. As the hide boiled, a thick, sticky substance formed at the surface of the water. This substance was removed and used as a binding agent. <laughs> Off of a what? A sacrificed animal. We understand what he was talking about here? I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to give these people the blood, and they're going to hold you together with it. It's our job. It's our job to quit bending our need to sin and to bring everybody into this family, into this bridehood by obedience through the Torah and to bring them together as a strong family covered in the blood of Yahshua and tell you, you were sinning, but you can't do it anymore. We must condemn sin in the flesh. It's how we hold the family together. Now look around us. Look at some of our brethren. They're outside banging on the door. Every now and then they want to stick their head in just to see what we're doing or to talk bad about. There's going to come a time when that door's going to be locked. Yahshua said, I open it and no man close it. And I close it and no man open it. And if you happen to be on the outside in the flesh, in that family, you can't come in. Whose hand closed the ark door? Just as in the days of, so shall the coming of the son of Adam be. This is much more than something we speak. It's a way of life. Yahshua condemned sin in the flesh. And if we're not condemning it, how can we say that we're his children? Brother, you should not be doing that. We should be treating the women of Yah with respect and honor and covering them. And we as men should make them feel like we are willing to die for them as Yahshua gave his life for the assembly. I get so irritated sometimes when I hear some of the things that are coming from so-called believers in Yahshua. Oh, it's okay. He'll... They'll come along. Just give them time. Are you kidding me? No. No, what, what we're doing is wrong. We need to stop admonishing one another to stop sinning. It's our duty. And bringing them in after they repent and showing them the ways of Yah and getting them covered in this mortar, this glue is what we're supposed to be doing if we are indeed the family mishpoka of Yah. This is just in one of the words. Now he gets to the brethren. Brethren is Hebrew word. Going back to the polyglot, you can find this word. In the polyglot goes back to the Hebrew number 251. We're going to read the Strong's definition there. Hebrew number 251. It's the Hebrew word, ak. 
or aki, some people say. It's a primary word, primitive. A brother, this is the Strong's definition now, used in the widest sense of literal relationship and metaphorically, listen to this, metaphorically, now remember he was speaking parables here, so metaphorically fits what we just read. Affinity or resemblance like it. Do you see what he was saying? These brethren were going to resemble him, be like him. He's the one that provided the blood, and he said, you guys are the ones that's going to cover the body with the blood. We're going to resemble him, the way he walked, the way he talked, what he taught, how he covered, and how he was willing at every moment to give his life for the nation of Israel and for his bride. How many of us in the room feel so like we haven't really been doing that? This is why we need Shabbat. This is why he says to gather in the place where I make my name dwell. This is why we make the feasts. This is why we're supposed to be a priesthood. Cover, cover, cover. Cover your bride with love and honor and respect and be ready to shed blood for her. Hmm? Who's the first one that bleeds in a relationship? I rest my case. The ancient Hebrew lexicon... is number 1008 AN on page 53. Page 53, number 1008 AN, and there you'll see Aleph Het. A strong fence or a strong wall, a strong tent wall, right? What makes the tent wall strong? The mortar of the blood. This is my mother and my brother. This is the one that houses, right? The bride, Israel, the people. This is a wow moment. On page 53 in the left-hand column, about halfway down, there you'll see AN108, 1008, AN, Aleph, Het. And there you see the first definition isn't brother. It's hearth. H-E-A-R-T-H. Hearth. A dividing wall that protects the family from what? The fire. <laughs> At the end of the Messianic age. Well, let's let's back up a little bit. If we're in the priesthood and being covered now, it's going gonna, it's gonna to save us from the fire that's going to come uh, upon uh, Edom, who is Esau, Amalek, Ishmael, and everybody who has ever joined seed with them. Edom became Rome, and Rome became the church, and the church produced Protestantism. I'm trying pull people out of the fire here. Because like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you're walking next to the one that resembles a man, but is not limited to the form of a man, 
and you're walking around with him in the fire. Do we understand what Daniel was speaking about here? What happened with them? Not one thing on those men were scorched. But the, even the men who threw them in it were consumed. Hmm? So, the first word is hearth, a dividing wall that protects the family from the fire. The second definition is brother, one who stands between the enemy and the family, a protector. And he pointed at who? the top ones, and said, these are the people that are doing that. Not Yaakob, my brother out there, with my mom. These people that are hearing my word are the ones that are being brought into the priesthood right now by the Melek Zadik himself. And they were going to produce, help produce a blood covering and protection that will guard people from the fire. We don't see that in the English anywhere in that chapter. What we do see is the simplicity of the complexity by the actual word that was uttered by the Mashiach. He's saying the Mishpachah, the one who covers, is not my immediate family. It's those who are here with me, walking with me now. Our halak, our halakha, must look like his. Those who do what he did. Oh, brother, don't do that. How about, oh, let's, let's cover that. Oh, don't help a brother. Right. The customs and the li lifestyles, not of the rich and famous. but of the meek that inherit the earth. So, Yahshua points at his disciples and says, these are the ones who produce, look at this, look at these letters. He points at his disciples, and he said, these are the ones who produce the strong flowing liquid The ones building the strong wall that protects from the fire to come. The ones standing between you and the enemy providing protection. How does the priesthood sound to you now? Hallelujah. So are the words of Teddy Wilson really hard on people? Just trying to protect all of us from the fire. But if you want to take your chances with heat, go to Southern California. Right? <laughs> yeah. So the ones doing the Father's will were the ones that were doing that. And they were truly not physical family but they were truly mishpokah that traveled and walked and were taught by the high priest, training them in the ways of a priesthood. And somebody asked me to take a look as we close this evening at Psalm 68. I forget which verse they, but we're going to be looking at verses 21 through 24. In the book of Tehillim, chapter 68. 
I'm going to read this from the King James because, well, the holy name, King James. So we can see the words that they were inquiring about. Verses 21 through 24. Now, they had asked me to, uh, to clarify what the significance was in verse 24 where it says, King in the sanctuary. So they wanted to know the significance of king in the sanctuary, but I wanted to know the significance of their question, so I went back a little ways. <laughs> and let's read verses 21 through 24. But Elohim shall wound, look at this, Elohim shall wound the head of his enemies and the hairy scalp of such a one as goeth on still in trespass. What is the definition of sin? Trespass, transgression of the law. He's going to wound the people. It doesn't mean they're going to Gehenna, but they're going to receive a wound. In other words, let's see you try to hobble in in a dead sprint with a broken leg into the millennial reign. Trying to keep up with the flash of lightning that comes from the east to the west. Huh? There's going to be people wounded that do not or that refuse to correct themselves from trespassing and transgressing against Yahweh's commands. This is the word in its unadulterated form. Listen to this. So he's going to wound those who goeth on still in his trespass. Verse 22. Yahweh said, I will bring again from Bashan, and I will bring again from the depths of the sea, that thy foot may be dipped in the blood of enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. They have seen thy goings, O Elohim, even the goings of my El, my King in the sanctuary. So the Melek Zadik in the sanctuary is saying that he's going to wound. Guess what? You're not the Melek. I'm not the Melek. Nobody sits as Melek except for the Zadik. Even the Melchizedek priesthood has to take orders from the high priest. So if we want to think that we can continue to trespass, be prepared for the wound, not the blessing. It's pretty simple. Now, what is the uh, soul level of study? What can we glean from this king that's in the sanctuary? What it's telling us is clearly that Elohim will cause a wound to come upon those who trespass his commands, for he is the king in the sanctuary. No one else. All we have to do is look at his word, and it tells us what is and is not allowed. And who is the teacher that has the right or the brother or the sister that's supposed to be creating a bond, how do we have the right to say things like, oh, well, they'll come along. What we're saying is, oh, they're wounded now. But hopefully they'll get it together But when he comes. Do you, right, Yahweh, help us. Do we understand now what it means to admonish a brother? Or a sister? You're trying to protect them from being wounded by the king. He comes with a double-edged sword, everyone. That's going to be a deep wound. You know, that sword cuts both ways, too.
king is Hebrew number 4428, and this Hebrew word malak, or melek, and it comes from the root word malak. So let's read the definition and its root in the Strong's. Hebrew number 4428 in your Strong's. Forty four twenty eight just says Melek. It comes from forty four twenty seven and it says a king. But looking up above it at its root, number fourteen twenty seven, it's the word Malak, and it's a primitive root, and it means to reign. To ascend the throne. To induct into royalty. He's either going to wound or he's going to induct you into a royal priesthood, a holy nation. No one has the right to tell someone it's okay where you're at. You'll be fine. No. The way we should be approaching this as kings and priests, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, is this. I understand where you're at. But through the strength of Yahshua and by his blood and prayer, we can get you from the nature that you are into the nature that you will be. That's our job. It's pretty simple. We don't have to excuse the sin. We can encourage those people to come out of the sin. Sanctuary is Hebrew number 6944, and of course that's the Hebrew word Kodesh. 6944 in the Strong's. Kodesh. It comes from 6942, and it says, a sacred place or thing. So, royalty, speaking from a holy place, is the one that said trespassers are going to be wounded. We cannot speak against that. That's the significance of of this king in the sanctuary is that he's going to wound people and we don't have the right to say that he won't. We would be speaking against the warning of a king that's trying to get us to bring people into the faith, not tell them you're okay where you're at and you'll come along just fine. I just hope you don't get wounded between now and then. <laughs> that's just, that is just the, 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 the theology there is just backwards. It's Christian. That's what it is. It's Christian mindset. You can approach him step by step. It's just baby steps. No, he said, repent. He calls for all men now to repent. He didn't say take baby steps. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yahshua Messiah, for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The root is number 6942, Kadash. To be, cause, make, pronounce, or observe as clean, ceremonially or morally. The king in the sanctuary is the only one that can declare things ceremonially clean and unclean. We don't have the right to say to people, you're okay, just keep going a little bit at a time. Because we can cause them to be wounded. Right? Yahweh is going to wound those who trespass his commands. For he alone is the one who reigns in the sacred place when he pronounces what is clean 
or not clean ceremonially or morally. So if our morals are contradicting his morals, then we have a problem because we say that it's okay for them to come along as they are, when actually he says, no, those people are going to be wounded. That is the significance of the king in the sanctuary. He's the king and we're not. We can't declare things clean that are obviously unclean. So thank you for sending in that question. Hallelujah. If anybody else wants to call in or comment, ask for prayer, please do so right now. 208-553-8393. Does anybody in the room have a question or a comment this evening? Okay, somebody had Brother Little Mitch, the mic back there. Uh, yeah, Brother, I got a question. Um, I hear like know what's going on with Puerto Rico and all these earthquakes and stuff like that going on. Uh, what do you think about as people saying pray for the world? What do I think about people saying that we should pray for the world? Baloney. We should pray for the repentance of the world. Uh, we don't. Yahweh already condemned the world. <laughs> so, I mean, to pray for a world that's already condemned is just unjustifiable. But if you pray for the repentance of the people in the world and the new Yerushalayim, not the old one, if we pray for the reestablishment of the land of Israel with the people of Israel so that it could actually be the nation of Israel, then we have something to pray about. So you don't want to pray for the people in the world. You want to pray that the world would repent to come into the nation. Well, that also... Um... But as Yeshua has seen spoken in John 17, I pray not for the world, but pray for those who you sent me. That's exactly what point I'm trying to make here. Um, he says, he said, Father, I thank you for the men that you have given me out of the world. Let them be one as you and I are one. Right? So that says that we can't be one with him if we're in the world. And I don't mean walking around in it. I mean morally and ceremonially, we are still in the world instead of morally and ceremonially clean and not unclean so that we can be part of the nation that he is regathering at this time. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Hallelujah. Then my job is done. Okay, well, let's go ahead and pray out. Oh, yes. My bride-to-be just reminded me. Brother Larry is out there in Texas with his mama. She's in her 80s. And she's lost 25 pounds. She's in the hospital. She needs a heart valve transplant. So we want to lift up Brother Larry. Pray that Yahweh will strengthen him. And if they do this surgery, that his mother will recover speedily. And he can get back here to be with his family. Hallelujah. In Yahshua's mighty name. We thank you, Father. And we, your people, worship you. And pray that you will help us be more like the image and the person of your son each and every day. Create in us a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us so that we can do the things that please you. So that we can feel the desires of our heart that line up with your desire. We praise you and we lift up the whole body of Messiah to you right now, Father. Pray that you would look down upon us. Let your face shine upon us. And that you would look down upon us with graciousness and favor as we worship you during your moed. And we pray this in the precious name of Yahshua. Hallelujah. 
Okay, everybody out there, um, join us tomorrow morning for our live Sabbath service. We're going to be continuing in this beautiful language. And we're going to be looking at what it takes to be a cupbearer for the Most High. Hallelujah. So we look forward to seeing you tomorrow and tuning in. I want to thank you for being with us this evening. May Yahweh be praised. Till tomorrow, may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh's face shine upon you and show favor to you. May Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom.